there's always like this time lag between when things change and when people figure out that things have changed. So during COVID, obviously car prices, used car prices and new car prices went through the roof. And of course, what that did is it affected the used car market. So used car prices, which had risen dramatically because new car dealers were buying used cars now because they didn't have new cars to sell, started to fall. Uh, and it took a while for people to realize that that was a dynamic that was happening. So you'd go on Craigslist and you'd see people asking for absurd prices that were fair like a year ago, which are completely you know, absurd today. And maybe that's what's happening with, in the classic car world where, where the market has, the, the, the sellers haven't caught up to where the market is. We have a tradition, for those of you who don't know, where you and I do a tour of all the auto shows together. We just did that. And this one was a bit of a twist in that we talked about where the industry is going went by car manufacturer here at the uh, Chicago Auto Show. But today, I actually wanted to start our conversation on classic cars. Close to my heart, let's talk classic cars. Yeah, well, you and I both have, I think we have a disease with classic oh, yeah, cars. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I've blown a lot of money. <laughs> I've blown a lot of money. <laughs> you know, I have a, you know that, that 90, uh, 87, 911 we have? Oh yes. I've had it for three years. It's, in, it's been in my possession for like two months. It two is months. a special car. And you and I, we've actually been threatening to do a video on that car yeah. together where like, basically the entire video is just me telling you about the mistake you made. Yeah, well, you because did. you keep on paying for more mistakes, yeah, fixing yeah, the mistakes. Yeah, I, I mean, what's the use of a car you can't drive, can't look at? It's just sitting at the shop for two and a half years, dude. Well, this is this is why we have to have this discussion, because yes. I was in Barrett Jackson. Oh, nice. Uh, last week, I was supposed to go to RM as well, mm -hmm. but uh, through a series of ridiculous events with United Airlines, I'm saying calling them out because I had four, count them, four mechanical problems in a row. <laughs> you know what's the worst? Yeah. When you get on the plane and then you don't like back out of the gate and you're just sitting there like, you, you, first of all, you don't notice it, right? And yeah. They close the doors and you're like, okay, we're good to go. And then like 10 minutes passes and you're like, uh-oh, something's going on. And that happened last week after I'd already been thrown off one plane because of a mechanical problem. We literally were flying from Atlanta to Chicago, diverted to Orlando, Florida, because the de-icing thing didn't work. And I'm the only person on the plane didn't get angry because I understand you have to go to Florida to land the plane. You know, I'm not sure if it's worse if they tell you the reason or don't tell you the reason. So I was going to Chicago from Atlanta, ended up in Florida, got put on another flight six hours later, same problem. There was something about they didn't have a thing and they were on the tarmac and like, oh my God, we're going to get it fixed. It took them two hours. I again got the, not diverted, but that time I had I stranded in Denver that night. Yeah, I know, it's the worst. Anyway, so it's because of all these flight issues, I missed RM. And that, I thought, was a pivotal sale for a couple of reasons. Number one, there was great stuff, but there was a lot of cars that no sale. One in particular, Porsche 959. Okay. That car, they've been selling for two million plus for the past year, two years, something like that. And no, I don't think that was a virus thing, because how many did they make? And was the car important when it was new? Absolutely. Did it have competition history? Absolutely. Um, that car, re I would argue, is one of the things that reinvented Porsche. That no sell for $1.5 million. Yeah, you know, it's always hard to discern when the car pops, right? When it goes from like being kind of under the radar and all of a sudden it goes up. Whether it's a trend or whether there are two buyers in the room who want it so badly that that car is the outlier in terms of its value. And I think it's also, dangerous sometimes to make too many assumptions when a car doesn't sell, right? Maybe this time the, the right guys or gals weren't in the room. So I don't know how far you can extrapolate that. You're probably better at that than I am. So in that case, I would argue it's in a class of what's called a blue chip, a blue chip classic. 300 SLs, uh, Ferrari, La Ferraris, that kind of stuff, where there is a market for that car anywhere in the world. You couldn't say the same about certain muscle cars. Like you're not gonna take a Chevelle SS396, it's not gonna sell well in Europe. That's why the value is only here, where you would take, I'll make it up, a mid-year Corvette. Those now have an international value and have become these blue chip investments. The 959, it's one of those things where it's so rare that the market didn't really pop 
it just grew over time. Mm. Not that long, believe it or not, you're talking like 20 years ago, 25 years yeah, ago, they were, they were 200 grand. Yeah. Well, because they're so complicated, they're hard to maintain, they're hard to You know, it's ensure. funny, I didn't know how bad that was. I recently went to the Porsche Classic Center yeah. and got the whole tour of the place. You know, you hear these stories about people buying, I'll make it up, a Carrera GT for 400,000 new, yeah. right? Yeah. And then they sold it for a million one, right? Yeah. But they don't tell you that the cam job on that thing's $160,000. Yeah. Yeah. So you really make that much money. 959 is the same complex car. But I feel like that is like the canary in the coal mine of all the stuff we could get into the larger economic issues facing the world. But we're getting into the stagnation, and now it's in the classic car market. And speaking of SLs, I think there was an SL that went for way more than standard market. I want to say it went like... At Barrett-Jackson. At Barrett-Jackson. It was crazy. Crazy, so yeah. That's had a no outlier. sale. Yeah. It was an outlier because I would say you had two very drunk bidders. Yes. That's the reason why the, the bidding bar is there, and it's free, <laughs> yes. much like in Vegas. Yes, of course. Uh, you do the math on that one. Um, so another, like, contrast, RM had a Goldwing. It no-sailed, and those no cars point. were selling for $2 million. Exactly. I'll tell you, a Goldwing probably not worth $2 million. No. Is it worth one five? Absolutely. Now, the problem why they're not worth $2 million, they made 1400 of them. Can I tell you a story? You want to hear a story? Tell me a story. Yeah, I'll tell you a story. Uh, so I lived in this love Roman story. I lived in this middle class neighborhood, and um, it was one of those neighborhoods where like you own a house that, that your neighbor can also own. You know what I mean? There's like yeah. the, like multiple versions of that house, and uh, the very last two houses that were built in the neighborhood were custom homes, which is odd. And if you looked at them from the outside, you'd be like, oh, those are cool. And there was one thing that was two things that were unique. They both had weather vanes that had cars on them. And then if you look close enough, you would notice that they shared a driveway. And that driveway not just went in front of the house, but behind the house. So I was like, that's really weird. Mm. And so it turns out, and I want to do a video, but you would not let me do this, that the guy who owned both houses had built one as his home and his other one as a garage for his cars. I like this guy. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's talk about the garage car, right? You would open up the garage and you could, regular garage and then everything on the ground floor was just open so the whole ground floor was a garage upstairs was a regular office space and then the basement that's why there was a driveway you could drive around and then there was an elevator and he would work on his cars so he lived in this house and then he had an entire house this is a dream setup yeah yeah, yeah. entire house that was just his garage so he he's like hey let me show you my cars i'm like thank god so i walked in there he had both uh the uh, convertible and the traditional SL, both of them. And he was one of the guys, if you're not aware, there's a very famous tour race, I don't know what you want to call it, the Colorado Grand, right? Which is- Of course is, we know about you, these. You know the Colorado Grand, right? Colorado you, you Grand, have have Copper certain, State 1000, yeah. California Mille, yeah. Yeah, so it, it, you know, for very rich people, you have to have a certain era of car, and then there's a cop in front of you, there's a cop behind you, and the It's a great are, experience. The laws are kind of squishy. Yeah, it's, Fluid. Yeah, so it's it's a lot of fun, but you have to be of a certain <laughs> bank account to actually afford doing it. Uh, he had a Jaguar E-Type, uh, and he had all these, you know, probably had like $10 million worth of cars in his so house. So you need to become best friends with a guy like that, because then I what he'll do, he'll invite you on the rally, and then you get to drive the car. That's the only way I've done rallies like that. I tried, and I wanted, I wanted you know, to shoot a video, because it's such a beautiful setup, like a dream car garage, literally. They have one house, it's nothing but- But he a, wouldn't go for the video? No, because he didn't want people knowing that he had like $10 million worth of cars in this like middle-class neighborhood in a house So a little bit behind the scenes, actually. This is what I learned actually the hard way, and once you and I got into this business, and we got into the business at the same time, um, I thought you'd have all these people that would want to share their classic cars. It turns out a lot of them don't. They're very quiet. And for the reason that you yeah. say, that they don't, they don't want to be ostentatious, they don't want to say, hey, look at me, they don't want drawing attention to themselves. And there's others that do, and a lot of those people, they'll never get on camera. They'll say, hey, you can take my car, but I, I don't want to stand in front of it. And it usually works out better that way because I want to tell a story about the car, not so much the person that, that owned it. Anyway, back to Arizona. Back to Arizona. Barrett Jackson, yeah. So you had the no sale on the, 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 the 959, you had the no sale on the Goldwing at, at RM, but then over at Barrett Jackson, you'd swear happy days are here again. It's a weird economy. It's a very weird different economy. business there. So they did have a lovely Goldwing. It wasn't as lovely as the one over at RM, and it went for like $3 million, which they're not worth that. An alloy bodied car, meaning they only made a couple of them that were literally made, the body itself was aluminum, not just the actual birdcage uh, structure of the car, that car should be worth $7 million. 
You can't tell me that a non-alloy body car in silver is worth $3 million, but then what happens at Barrett-Jackson? Trucks. Yeah. Restomons, whether yeah, they're trucks or cars. I have a you theory on that. You swear everyone has two to $300,000. So, so we were talking about this, so here's my theory. Restomons, especially if they're done by the right builder, somebody who has a reputation for building high quality vehicles, I think Restomons are the new American, um, uh, not dragster, uh, but... Uh, hot rod? Hot rod, yeah, are the new American hot rod. Because uh, I think what happened was the guys, maybe 10, 20 years older than us, right, who grew up, because I didn't grow up in the 60s. I, I, I never, like, lusted after Kudas or Hellcats. Mm. It, it, they're cool, but I was, like, never, like, I, I never saw the value. I, I'll tell you why. So when I went to college uh, in University of Colorado, and now we're talking about the mid-80s, right, I had a friend who had a Cuda. And at that point in my life, Kudas were, like, you bought it for, like, 5K. Right, and he had the classic setup where he had the big mags in the back, and he put air, mm -hmm. and so he could jack up the thing. And, and, and if you remember the '80s, there were these horrible cars that were like a mission stroke, and we would drive up I-70, which is now the I call it for us, and we would just fly up that hill. And you know, he had glass packs, and it would just reverberate. It was such a cool car, but it was worthless, right? Because it, it was like 10 years old, and it mm -hmm. was just an old car. And then, of course, all of a sudden, all those cars went through the roof when. The guys a little bit older than us got money, and all of a sudden, you know, they early two thousands to yeah, about two thousand. Yeah, these are worth fifty, then a hundred, then one hundred and fifty. Matching numbers, cars two hundred, especially if it's you know some some special version of it. And I never really got that because in my mind they were always kind of like bargain cars. Um, but I think those guys have gotten older, and it's hard to drive those cars because a lot of them don't have power steering. You know, the brakes aren't great. <laughs> you know, I mean they were they were meant for straight line speed, and so you want Apple CarPlay, you want Android Auto, but you want that old hot rod ish muscle car feeling and so you resto mod it and you get somebody who does not just a resto mod job but actually creates art to some extent right just does it beautifully and then those cars have become very desirable for those older guys because they're comfortable and they can drive them with air conditioning on it works and you know apple carplay and android auto and i think that's my theory as to why those have gotten so, so expensive I've, I've got a different view on this. Um, Very American. I've, I've been following the classic car hobby for many years yeah. now. And I saw this already happen once. I've been through this rodeo okay. once. In that time of figure 2002, 2003, up to 2007 and the economy then crashed. And Barrett Jackson was the barometer of this. They're the ones that brought, I would argue 10 years prior to that, they brought the muscle cars into play and they started to grow in value. But then they started bringing the resto mods in the mid 2000s, and they went from the car that was worth less than a numbers matching Hemi Cuda to the car that's now worth more than the numbers matching SS396. And then the market changed. Then, after the economy crashed, the old, all muscle cars crashed, but the ones that didn't crash as much and stayed as steady as possible were the numbers matching original cars because there's more of a market for those cars. Where resto mods, yes, I would agree with you. People want the automatic transmission with six forward gears, car play, and air conditioning, and the wide tires, not the bias ply tires, and they get that. And then there's another level where you do get the artwork. Like, for example, at Barrett Jackson, I don't know if you saw it, someone did a resto mod Hummer H1, and it went for 750 grand. I saw that, yeah. That was... I saw the car in person, and I estimated the build <laughs> minimum 400 grand. I was watching that, and people were like, what are you going to do with that? I'm like, it doesn't can't matter. Drive it. Yeah, well, you can't drive it. Yet. That one you can't drive it. But that one's art. Yeah. But here's the problem. Those cars, there's no market for them down the road because there's gonna, always going to be another one. It's kind of like your mother lives in Florida, right? Yes. And So you're saying Florida, you can always build more. You can always build more. Like, yeah, you could buy a house in Boca Raton and you got this beautiful like re resale in St. Andrews Country Club. But they got another one down the road that's going to be nicer. You're going to buy the resale in St. Andrews. You're going to buy the one you can custom build. Yeah, I agree. And you know what else has popped? Like, uh, remember Icons? Yes. You know, those cars were, if you got one a couple of years ago, maybe five, ten years ago, when you first started building like the FJs, right? Those were 150000 Now those are like 400000 depending on the car. But it's not just them. You've got Singer. Yeah, Singer, same thing. You've got Gunter Works. And they're all the Mercedes is getting into this whole game. So what does that tell us about where the market's going? I think, I think that tells us that people want something that their neighbors don't have. I think it's like watches, right? You want that like in the box, Rolex, you know, with the little warranty card, right? The, 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 the unicorn in the watch world. And people want that in the car world, but a lot of those cars have gotten too expensive. So now you can 
sort of kind of get that in the resto mod world, right? You can have somebody build that for you. But, but it, the, be the a opposite singer, is happening or be now. Or the Gunther works. Like you, I was sitting at Barrett Jackson, yeah. hanging out with my buddies, all classic car people, and we we're watching the cars go by, and I'll make it up a numbers matching and pickup trucks were the thing this year. That's the thing that hit this year. So a numbers matching like late 60s Chevy pickup truck, mm. maybe 80 to 100 grand. The resto mod version of that, 300 grand. Yeah. And I'm willing to bet you. Are we you could, a 60s pickup truck? <laughs> I'm sure it's garbage, but I'm willing to bet you. <laughs> we had an F100. In 10 years, <laughs> the car that's going to be worth more is a numbers matching yeah, car. Yeah, I mean, it's like furniture, right? It's only original ones. Absolutely. And, and then if you repaint it, it becomes less valuable. And if you resto mod it, I think you're building it for yourself, right? And I think people, this is a very concept that I think a lot of people sometimes miss when they buy a car and they make it their own. It's beautiful in their own eyes, but it's much harder to sell because now you've made it your own. So, so then why would like you and your... <laughs> oh my God, yeah. I waited <laughs> three made, years. <laughs> you made that your own <laughs> with your GT3. But the, it came out beautiful. It did. It's a beautiful car. I mean, it is a very special build. Yes. And I'm not the one just saying. I love the color. It. I love the uh, color. And the wheels are just absolutely you got to come and drive it. i got to like, see it. You're going to love this I got to see it thing. in the light, yeah. I got some special thing changes. Is that, that your forever car? Um, or are you going gonna to get, like, at some point, you're like, time for it? I mean, no. let's say if they tempt me with another allocation, I want to do the Euro delivery. That's the only thing I didn't get. Yeah. And if I can get another allocation, I'll do that. that. Wouldn't that be, like, magnificent to configure a car and then pick it up and drive it on the autobahn or oh, drive I had these visions of Andy was going to sign my car drive it out of flock that was my vision yeah. but they, you know they took it away from me no, they, so that's yeah, COVID took it away that's the me. only thing that makes it not my forever car other than that it is yeah. it's been my dream car for many years I don't know I'd be terrified like I, you know if you have a car like that nice and you're in California you kind of know where to drive it and where you can park it and where mm. you can park it Right, so you get that dream car, you pull it out of you know the factory, mm -hmm. and then you're on the autobahn, and you pull over at some rest stop in Germany. And you're like, uh, can I go to the bathroom here, or do I need to well, stay with the car? Well, that's a good point. Like, you so Roman I mean? and I have an unusual situation where we we really don't daily our own cars. Yeah. We daily the cars we're shooting, and you know, I just had the Spectre. There's one right down there. Yeah. Five hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. Could not care less where it's I parked best, it. it. No problem. But when I drive my car, man, I am a nervous Nelly. Exactly. I'm I'm the guy over way in that corner over yeah. there. You know where to take it in Malibu. You know where you can park it, and you know where not to take it. In and LA. I'm more worried about the wheels and tires or anything. Exactly. And it's the one thing I normally never buy the warranty. Yeah, I never do the I, got it on the and tires. I bought the wheels, yeah. tires, glass, and key. Porsche sells that one package, yeah, and I've already used the tire one. Yeah, so uh, as you know, the GT3 has this very thin glass. Oh right? yes. To to make it lighter, to make it you know more. Yeah track worthy uh, and uh, yeah, in Colorado that would be <laughs> shattered like that because we, so, we use rocks right well you got sand so, on the road there so as well the, yeah because yeah, they don't do they, salt they, they do sand well they do mag chloride now so unfortunately oh they do god it, I could I never know. drive I know. there I know great Colorado. roads Why? up there though they are the, the summer wonder anyway right, we, back, let's go back to, back to my yeah. point yeah. so what are you saying so I get it you want to have a car that no one else has you want the watch that no one else has and that's the, if you have two, three hundred grand, sure, it's a different discussion we could have about where they're getting their money. We'll get to that later. However, why Crypto. wouldn't you just go, why wouldn't you just go and have one built and you do everything instead of spending two to three hundred grand at, at, at an auction like that? <sighs> yeah, um, so I don't, I, I'm with you on that one. It's the finding it. It's the, it's the, you know, finding the unicorn, right. and and you have to spend time and effort, and you have to, if there's a guy, negotiate him down, and you know what I mean. That is really exciting, and that is fun. When you're at some auction, it just goes across, and you have a wad full of cash. You're like, okay, I'll take that one. Boring as hell. I'm sorry, it's just boring. It's not, it's not fun. And and also, classic cars, they're going to outlive me and you, right? So I. Figure, well, we are caretakers. Yeah, we're uh, yeah stewards, caretakers of the vehicle, uh, and so. What I like to do and what I enjoy doing is I buy one and then I fix it up. And for me, being original is more important, so I, I won't resto mod it. I'll actually un, well, I don't like, people don't like when I use the word M, the M word, so I'll unmodify it. I'm mm -hmm. talking about a different M word. And then I'll bring it back to original, and then that makes me very happy. And then what really makes me happy is finding a new home for it. A boat, you have to get the hell out of it, right, to get rid of it because it's this huge hole in your wallet. Mm. But with a car, Finding it a good home and seeing the new owner and seeing the joy in that person's 
you know, face when they take ownership of it. So mm -hmm. that's what I mean. To me, it's not about collecting these things. It's not about a commodity mm -hmm. that, you, that you, you know, you, you buy and then you hold on to it and you try to figure out how much it's going to gain and how much money. And it, it doesn't give me any joy to, to say I bought a car and then I flipped it for $100,000 more. Mm -hmm. uh, because first of all, if you've got that much money, really, do you need more? And these guys that are buying, like, like let's talk. How many yachts can you water ski behind? Yeah, how many homes can you own? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that kind of money, but it to, to me, at some point, if the thing's He's too, never seen the movie. If the thing's too valuable, it, 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 it owns you, you don't own it. Well, that, okay, now you're getting into my Dave Ramsey philosophy of life. Do you, do you, does your home own you, or do you own the home? I totally get that part of it. Where I would argue there's two avenues here. Yeah. Well, three. There's the avenue of what you just said, where it's the thrill of the hunt, and you're more, you're the bind, barn fine hunter like Tom Cotter, you're yeah. that guy. And I totally understand and you, that. You don't have to go, like, like crawl through barns, you could go on Craigslist, you can go on Facebook Marketplace. It's not the kind of cars you're talking about. There's never gonna be, you know, some kind of like, I think everyone auction, knows auction what a quality. GT3 Touring is yeah, worth. It's not gonna be, everyone knows yeah, what exactly. a 959 is worth. But I, I don't live in that world. Well, then we get to the second world, and the second world is, and this, I think, only has happened in the past 20 years, since 9-11, since the economy falling off a cliff in 08, and then since the virus. You get these people, and I think this somewhat justifies the people at like an auction where they say, I'll take that one. They're 70. And they're like, you know what? I just gave up three years of my life to lockdowns. I want to drive that car yeah, with I my wife. I can't take it with I me. Think, I don't know if that's the answer. You want to give it to my That's the only thing that- kids. <laughs> Well, the kids don't even want it. You saw Peter Mullen, amazing yeah. car collection in California. There's, the kids don't want it. The guy died, and within a month, they decided they're going to set, close the museum and sell the cars. So I've got, I've got a couple of questions I'm always pondering. How many yeah. times do you think we've seen the same car go over the block? Well, I've seen them a lot now. Yeah. And how many times, like in the ebb and flow of time, right, how many times do people like work really hard and put together a great collection only to have it be scattered in the wind, only to have somebody else put it back together? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a story that's a commentary on me being an old man at this yeah. point. I moved to California on October 3rd of 2006. In the first two weeks I was there, David Gooding, Gooding Auctions, amazing, he does the Pebble Beach Auction, great guy. He puts together a sale of Otis Chandler's car collection, okay? okay? sells all these Otis. He was famous for having great collection, then sold it all, and he's the one that actually moved the needle in the muscle car collection. He built a huge muscle car collection, sold them all when the market went up, and then he started getting some of his pre-war stuff back and doing a mix. He had this museum in Oxnard, California. He dies. He was the publisher of LA Times. He dies. Family's like, we're done. We're selling everything, and that's it. Well, who buys the building? Peter Mullen. He amasses a collection of these, all these Bugattis and French cars, and builds this amazing collection, redoes the building, it has like a lead certified roof, the whole thing, and then rehabs the Peterson Automotive Museum. He dies, now in a month, they sell the collection. So it's the, in now 18 years, I've seen two collections taken out of the same building. I think Peterson probably did it right, you know? Or, he endowed the cars, yeah. he did it right. And yeah. he brought in a board of complete ridiculous gearheads. Like Bruce Meyer, a good friend of mine, he's the guy probably single-handedly grew the hot rod hobby, made it into something big. And he's the one that has been the steward of the Peterson along with Peter Mullen, where now Peter Mullen's important cars, he didn't leave them to the family. He ended up donating them to the Peterson as well as the money to keep them going in perpetuity. Yeah, it's kind of like buying land and then like uh, I think Rockefeller did that with uh, what to turn it into? Oh, the uh, park up in New York. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So basically, yeah. you give it to, to you know, yeah. in, per in perpetuity, and that's kind of a good way because then your name's associated with it. You, Absolutely. You, you live on, as opposed to like your kids take the collection and go. Because at the end of the day, we are just stewards of these things. Yeah, like yeah. my nephew already is looking at me like, "Buddy, take care of my watch. That's mine." <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I, 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 I hate as a as a passionate uh, like driver. Is when people, and this is a good example of that, the first gen GT, Ford GT, and second gen GT, right? The values of those are pretty steady and they're almost exclusively tied to how many miles they have. And the less miles, the more valuable they are. I'd what's, say any performance cars like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, but what's the point? You know, you have this beautiful car and every time you drive it, in the back of your head, dollars yeah. are just going click, click with the odometer, right? I had to make that decision with my car. It yeah. was, do you put no miles on it or do you drive it? I'm gonna drive it a little, like I've already put 2,000 miles on the car. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I'm gonna have, 
So, so, oh, so for those of you that don't know. Yeah, I have, a, I have a 911 He well. recently got a Porsche, too. Yeah, I got a 911 uh, Beautiful. Uh, Targa. It's old man spec. It's guards red with tan interior like your pants. I would say it's a classic yeah. spec. Yeah, it's not an old man. You are an old man. It'll come back around. Anyway, um, you know, Targa 4S, um, perfect because it's a driver. It's, you know, it's convertible when you want it to be. It's mm. a classic shape that Porsche has done forever. It's four wheel drive because in Colorado, you need it. I'd like to remind him that when he first told it's me about the allocation, the it's also the heaviest. It's also 3,800 pounds. Yeah, it's yep. the heaviest of them, yeah. He came to me with this idea and he's like, how should I spec it? And I told him all that you gotta get a 4S. He was, he was all for a four. And finally you were listening to me. Can I'm can glad I you did. Can I tell you a great story about Porsche? I'll tell you, you'll figure it out. So I get this car. Me and Tommy pick it up in San Diego and drive it all the way back to Colorado right away. Just to, you know, to me, that that experience of picking up a beautiful car, being able to share that moment with my son, and then being able to road trip it 1,100 miles, you know, uh, th that to me is worth more than the value of the car. And not the first time you did that. Yeah, so, you know, I'll have that memory, that moment forever. Anyway, wonderful trip, get home, go to drive it, and every time, you know, I hit the brakes, it sounds like a 10, 20, 30 year old Kia, right? Oh, just, I know where you're going with this. Every time I know it just exactly squeals, where you're going. squeals. Like, we oh, have the same problem. Oh, it's so annoying. It's terrible. And I don't have the ceramic, I just have. Neither did I. I have the regular metal brakes, right? Yep. So uh, it's driving me crazy because you spend a lot of money on these cars. Mm -hmm. And you're like, why does this sound like a, you know, clapped out Kia? And it's embarrassing, right? Kia sounds better. I know, it's embarrassing because you built it and it's like, the, the yeah. whole, everybody's looking at what, what is what is that? Yeah, what kind of junk is this guy? So I, I, was, at, uh, I was in Malibu uh, driving this prototype Porsche that they built to drive up to the top of the volcano in Chile, 22,000 feet above sea <laughs> level. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the engineers was there, actually had a bunch of engineers, which is great with, on these programs, Porsches actually have engineers. And I was like telling him about this um, issue I have. And he said, well, I'm not the brake guy. Um, the chassis guy, I think maybe the suspension guy, but I'll ask the brake guy. And you know, you, when, you, when people say that, you're like, sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I gave him my car, but it was just being nice. Yeah. He emailed me like yesterday. Oh, cool. Yeah. What year is your car? How many miles? I'm, you know, you know what I mean? That is so cool that actually. That's Porsche. A, a Porsche engineer contacted me to help me. It goes, this is not a dealership experience. This oh, is no, one I of the guys know. who actually developed the car is trying to solve my problem. So. So Porsche, thank you. And I didn't, we, you know, didn't use Porsche to get the car. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, bought it like any Neither other. Neither did I. I Took got the car from an allocation yeah. from the dealership contact. You got, no. you got an allocation. I mean, you know, you know, I didn't. You, know, I you got an allocation. You had to get an allocation to get yeah, the car. Yeah, it took like two years, but. <laughs> But that was the reality of the Porsche yeah, market. Yeah, exactly. So I had to wait for one to. I will say, if I had it to do all over again, I would do the carbon ceramics. A, because of the sound, and B. But I hear those squeal too. Th not as much. And the, B. The ST squealed. The, that, that had the carbon really bad. Yeah. But the. Um, the press one. The, it's killing me. It's breaking my back to clean the wheels on this thing. Because it's not the outside of the wheel you clean. You've got to get in there and yeah. clean basically the deep dish of the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, and this is too old, man, just complaining about stupid First things. First world problems. So, we're, so what's, the, what's our strategy moving forward? What, what, what have we learned from the market from two to $300,000 pickup trucks that are resto mods, comparing them against $80,000 pickup trucks that are matching numbers? And the same could be said, like even in the Grand National world, they used to be 30 grand, now they're 60, but there's some anomalies I saw. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. This is the weirdest economy. I've been waiting for it to crash. You know, you and me both. Forever, and it hasn't. It just keeps every stagnation. Yeah. Does it her the fact that there are these no sales on some of these cars that should have sold? Does that herald something? Maybe it's. I'll take a stab at it. You know, there's always like this, and I'm not going to talk about the expensive cars because that's your world, but not my world. But but there's always like this time lag between when things change and when people figure out that things have changed. Mm -hmm. So during COVID, obviously, car prices used car prices and new car prices went through the roof. And then very quickly that pendulum sw swang uh, over to the other side where um, what had happened was that the manufacturers had actually built a lot of vehicles, they just hadn't shipped them because they didn't have the chips. So there were, in the truck world, there were you know thousands of trucks sitting mm -hmm. in Detroit mm -hmm. with Ford. And then all of a sudden they got the chips and then they shipped all these things. So when people thought that we were gonna have like empty lots, all of a sudden the lots were full. Mm -hmm. And of course what that did is it affected the used car market. So used car prices, which had risen dramatically because new car dealers were buying used cars now because they didn't have new cars to sell, started to fall. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took a while for people to realize that that was a dynamic that was happening. So you'd go on crisis and you'd see people asking for absurd prices that were fair like a year ago, mm -hmm. which are completely you know, absurd today. And maybe that's what's happening with, in the classic car world where, where the market has 
the, the, the sellers haven't caught up to where the market is. That's my best guess. Um, I'll take a guess here as well. Okay. I don't think you're entirely wrong. Um, I think the no sales of like the 959, the no sales of the uh, of the Goldwing, and then I, there's others I didn't bring up. Like there were some cars that like I'll call them hundred thousand dollar classic cars that they didn't no sale, but they went for twenty to thirty percent below their what they're really worth. At least what the books have said they're worth. I think those are the canary in the coal mine because that's the smart money. That's the guy. Let's be honest. That's the guy that is like your buddy with the house, the two houses. Yeah. He's got money in the bank. He writes a check for those cars, and that's it. He's seeing where the market is going. Granted, he's just buying what he loves, but he sees where the market is going. If I were to take a stab in the dark, the guy spending two to three hundred thousand dollars on a resto mod of Barrett Jackson, I think he's pulling it out of a line of credit. Yeah, I, and I think that's, that's a why fair. I think there's a disparity fair. between the two. And, l and this is where I agree with you: the market, you're seeing that distance. It's kind of like the inverted uh, rate curves. Yeah, you know the rate yields. The, 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 there's a the, there's a delay of well, how much are you paying? How much is that is the is that fixed income investment paying you now as opposed to five years? If it's paying you more here now, it's telling you the market's going to fall apart. And I think that's the difference here. So, so it's the me, inverted yield curve. Let me ask you this. Um, you know, in the rec in recent 10 years, you know, Bring a Trailer has completely kind of blown up. Absolutely. Do, do you think that that's where the future is? Or can in-person auctions like Mecom and RM and Barrett Jackson, you know, actually survive that? Because Bring a Trailer is selling some pretty darn, I think they sold an F40 recently, if yeah. I remember right. They have edged their way up to yeah. very impressive blue chip classics like I'm talking yeah. about. You, uh, you, I would say I, the market- Barrett Jackson be worried, I guess. I don't think Barrett Jackson, uh, Barrett Jackson in particular should be worried because Barrett Jackson is not a car auction. They are an entertainment company. They are incredibly good at creating- yeah, They were just they were just bought by an entertainment company, actually. Well, they've been only been Endeavor half by yeah. Endeavor for a year, yeah, for yeah. the years now. Um, they are great at an activation. You know, love him or hate him, Craig Jackson, he has turned that company around, not around, but he's turned it into something that is an event that people come to yeah. no matter where it goes. They just announced a second Scottsdale uh, auction on the calendar. That's how much of an event it is. So you're going there well, to see the cars. It's entertainment, right? Exactly. It's, That's entertainment. Why it's a car Mecham, show. It's, it's, it's entertainment. Meekum is different. Meekum is yeah. a different scenario. I think they're the ones that have more to risk or more to lose. From like as bring a trailer. Bring a trailer or cars and, and P car and all that yeah. kind of stuff grow because think about it. Let's say you want to sell your Targa 4. Yeah. Are you going to wait until Scottsdale and then ship it to Scottsdale and then maybe yeah. take a risk? Or are you going to just put it on there at any time you want and you're in the comfort of your own home? Yeah, no, I, I, I completely understand. I also think that um, bring a trailer carries like a 25% premium no matter what car it is. Absolutely. I think, I think you, you get probably the highest amount of money. And then the other thing that I'd love to know, if you're watching bring a trailer, those guys are definitely going to know which way the market is going. And if they see a crash, do you think they'll be out there like <laughs> advertising? Because, I mean, they'll be the first, right? They're going to be the canary in the coal mine because they're going to see what's happening with yeah. those car prices. I'm already seeing some cars come go down. Yeah. There. I mean, I'm sure you have the same problem. If you look at my search history, it's like Siberian Huskies, <laughs> L.A. Real Estate, and Bring a Trailer. Yeah. And, like, I, miss, I, I think we've discussed this. I want a 79 Cadillac Eldorado. I want the factory sunroof, but no vinyl roof. Very hard car to come by, and missed it on Bring a Trailer. That would be a car super nice, would be worth 20 grand. Those are One sold to, for $9,900. Those are starting to go up. Those classic, like, 70s Absolutely. Cadillacs. Well, that's Lincolns. actually an 80s car. It was 70s, the last 80s, yeah. Bill Mitchell design of General Motors. I yeah. love, I'm going to have one at some point. For a long time, those were like five to $10,000 yeah. cars. So I think the, mar I mean, if you're talking about Bring a Trailer, I think the move is if someone's trying to make some money and basically get a deal, you buy on Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, and then you tart it up, and then you tote it up. The, the problem with all those cars is they're just so freaking big. <laughs> they're the exact opposite of motorcycles, right? You need a lot of space to have a... Well, that's always the... I had to sell one car Cadillac. to get another one. Yeah, yeah I totally oh, agree. Oh, like that takes up two car spaces. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Okay, so again, let's wrap this up. Where are we thinking the market's going to go over the next year? So, I, like I said, I've been thinking this, this economy's going to crash, but there's a lot of political... Uh, Put aside cars, give me three reasons why the economy is going to crash. No, I, I'm going I'm to say, I think there's a lot, because it's an election year, the, the current administration has a lot of incentive to make sure it doesn't crash. So if that means pumping money into the economy, if that means pulling whatever levers they can pull. So I, I think 
I think the economy is going to stay strong until after the election. I think if, if, if unless there's things like a local banking, banking crisis could yeah. be out of control, right? That could make things very unstable. But I think there's a lot of momentum in the current administration to make sure that gas prices stay low, that people stay employed, because that's going to mean victory for them. Wouldn't you think pumping more money into the economy would be like giving a drug dealer more drugs? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. See, that's where you get the stagnation. Yeah. But all it has to do is stay where it's at for, what? what is it now, eight more months. That's and then what happens after the election? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's what that we don't know. Uh, but I, I also think that because of COVID, a lot of cars have gone you know, through the roof that probably shouldn't have gone through the roof. I think, I think what happened is a lot of people realized, who weren't necessarily car people, that you can make, you know, for a long time, me and you, you know, we weren't in this to make money. We were in this because we love cars. Absolutely. But then cars became these very uh, profitable commodities to a lot of people. And so a lot of money came into the, into the classic car market, like the art market, mm. where it wasn't art lovers, it wasn't car lovers. It was people who thought to themselves, I can make a lot of money here. Mm. And I think that was bad for everybody involved. If you love mm. cars, um, what's it, what would be a good example of a car that was like super cheap? Oh, here's a good example in my world, like a Blazer, right? Those old Blazers, those were like ten thousand dollar cars. The, yeah. the big Blazers, I'm talking about, right? Yep, K5s. Yeah, K5s, and now they're eighty grand. Exactly. That's just crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, 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 those those cars are, are fun, and they're you know they represent America, but they drive like crap. Absolutely. <laughs> the, you know, the, the build quality is pretty about you know pretty dismal. The fuel economy is horrible, and, and you get like it's like one flavor of ice cream, and after you've had that flavor, you're like, okay, now what? And that mm. car can only provide, and yet it's an $80,000 car. It makes no sense. That's a car you could buy, own for a year, pass it on to somebody else. So I would argue that's a missed opportunity of the virus. There was a lesson there. And the lesson, this is really more for OEMs, was like, hey guys, look what happens when you, maybe not artificial limit supply, but you lower the overall supply, you maintain your profit, you maintain the overall sales rate as well as what you're selling each vehicle for. So basically your transaction prices stay higher. Yeah. And here we are, we're not even a year past all this stuff, meaning things really opening up again. And the Stellantis's of the world, the Fords of the world, they're now flogging the system. They're putting too much supply into the market. And as a result, they're back to the incentives. Oh yeah. Why didn't they take the lesson and say, you know what? Because we're instead in of making to, selling 17 million cars a year, how about we do 14? But that's what I love about America. It's 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 like ultimate capitalism and competition. Because in Europe, you you have exactly that dynamic, and cars are at least, depending on the country, 50 percent more expensive. Yeah. But here, it's like it's 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 you know it's it's a gunfight out there if you're a car dealer selling a new car. Yeah, I always when I lived in the UK, I always found found it fascinating. Like BMWs, it's literally it's like. The five crime families are the ones that control yeah. all the distribution of German cars right. in the UK, and as such, the prices remain very, very, yeah, very and, high. And here, it's just uh, bare knuckle capitalism, and uh, you know, uh, the theory I think is, you know, you don't make money by not selling cars. <laughs> in Europe, you can so. make like Ferrari makes money by not selling cars, but but GM and Stellantis and yeah. Ford do not make money by not even as hard as they can try. They're not going to make money by not selling. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but that's really what you're saying, right? You're saying you can drive up the, the unit cost and make more money as opposed to selling more cars for less money. You could make more money by selling less cars. And I think in America, you make, still make more cars by selling, might make more money by selling more cars. So the lesson here is we could act like we know where the future is going, but in reality, the only thing we know is there will continue to be boom bust cycles. Yeah no matter how many lessons are given to us buy. from the realities of the world. And buy what, you know, I would say it's very simple. Buy what you love, and if it makes money, and if it loses money, you, you have what you love. i got to tell you, I, I've always bought what I've loved, but I've stopped buying cars I know are bad investments. Yeah, like, fair I'm done with Lotus. Yeah. Oh, God. I'm done with cars that have bad resale. Aston Martin. <laughs> yeah, I, I love Aston Martin, but I've never owned one. I'd never, I don't even want one anymore. Yeah. I don't even want a Lotus. I don't even want to drive a Lotus anymore. Like, it's that bad. Yeah. Um, so that's our lesson. It's always going to be boom-bust cycle. Yeah. Well, thank okay. you, dude.
Let's continue to do this. Yeah. Matter of fact, you know what we should do? This is the point of the episode where we're turning around to the audience, and we should ask, where do they see the market going? Love the, I'll, I'll read the comments. Okay, so you heard the man. He's going to not only read your comments, but respond to some of your comments. Let us know in the comments below or via our social media. Moto Man TV on Word, Moto Man TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And with that, if you found value in this episode, Roman and I just wrapped a complete tour of the 2024 Chicago Auto Show, where it wasn't just looking at the cars, we talked about the new car industry. You can see that episode here. Until we see you in the next episode, be beta. How do you know I won't use uh, AI to answer? Maybe it'll just be TFL AI. Because you're too old, you don't know what AI is. Uh, yeah, it's true that. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks.